Hi, we're here at Applied Intelligence Live in a very warm Austin today. Um, I'm Susie Harrison, a commercial editor of our uh, publications here, and I'm very happy to be joined from Grok by Andrew Ling, Senior Director, Software Engineering and ML Compiler. Welcome. Thank you. So um, talk to us about latency and why it matters. Yeah, I mean, throughout my career, I've worked at a lot of big tech companies prior to joining Grok, and latency has always been one of those things you could not throw money at. You could not fix the problem. Like, these massive companies, these massive semiconductor companies, they're making billions, and they could always struggled with hitting certain latency targets. And why is that a problem? Well, it, it really blocks the amount of business problems that you can solve. When you can't hit your latency targets, nothing else matters. It really just it limits what you can do. Um, I think the easiest way to understand this is 4G, 5G, right? 4G, 5G networks. One of the biggest promises 5G has brought to us was a 10x improvement in latency. So what has that done? That really has opened up a swath of different applications. So autonomous driving, smart factories, things that actually need that real-time response that's what 5G has unlocked. It's really unlocked this sort of 10x factor in terms of what you can do with these technologies. You know, Andy Grove, uh, you know, the late Andy Grove from Intel always said that, you know, once you have this 10x change, it's really going to disrupt what you can do with these technologies. And Grok really has this 10x change in how we approach latency, where compared to the incumbents, we can actually run applications with 10x better latency than you know, what you see on graphics processors, what you see on multi-core processors. Um, so that is kind of our superpower. And when we showcase this, you know, when we run computer vision applications, large language models, and then show this uh, to customers, uh, they're blown away. They're like, oh, wow, I never knew you could actually run this fast, uh, these class of applications. We, we just kind of lived with the incumbents in terms of what we thought was possible. Uh, and this really unlocks a lot of interesting use cases that previously were impossible uh, with our technology. And why does, why, uh, why does determinism matter as well? So, it's, yeah, it's kind of related to latency in the sense. So, you know, first let's define determinism. Um, you know, the traditional definition is, you know, you run an application with a set of inputs, you get the same result, right? Like every time. So one plus one equals two. You know, that's kind of like the sort of common sense or intuitive explanation of what determinism is. And generally, all processors do that already. Uh, I mean, that's not totally true. There, we have seen issues with graphics cards where you send a result and then you send, sorry, you send in an input and you send the same input again. You actually sometimes get different results because of how it behaves. Um, so Grok definitely supports that level of determinism. But we take it a step further where we'll also support execution time determinism. So what I mean by that is our programs will run deterministically from a cycle level. So to the nanosecond, we will actually run exactly the same time every single time. So it kind of takes it to the next level where both in terms of functionality, we're deterministic, but both in terms of performance, we're also deterministic. Again, why does that matter? Um, it's a promise, right? Like from a business sense, if you have predictability in your business processes, uh, it becomes a superpower. You're able to plan better, you're able to forecast better. And this holds true for technology as well. Because we have a deterministic processor, everything around us that works with us is just more stable. Um, and this is going a bit into the weeds a little bit, but if you actually know and can promise the execution time of every single processor in your system, you can actually scale to thousands of processors in a seamless way. So it unlocks a lot of interesting tricks that you can do with the compiler, with the software to leverage the hardware because you have this deterministic process, uh, promise, both in terms of functionality, of course, and execution time. So. so I think you've touched on it a bit there, but how does um, Grok's processor differ from others? Yeah, like it's, I think maybe start, like to answer that question, maybe I can focus more on what we can do with it, and then I can talk back and like how, how is it actually different. Like the biggest thing that we can do differently is we can strong scale. 
And that's very different than what you can see on graphics cards, what you can see with like typical CPUs. So what do I mean by strong scaling? So when you scale problems, um, you know, there's usually two ways to do it. You can weak scale or you can strong scale. Weak scale is what most of the other vendors can do. And what I mean by weak scaling is, you know, you take a problem, you run it on one processor, let's say you have two processors, then you take two instances of the problem and you can solve you know, twice as many of uh, inputs as possible, but they're essentially separate problems, right? But that doesn't help you in a lot of cases, right? Like if you're in a car and you want to detect a stop sign, um, you don't really care that another car can detect that stop sign in like 10 seconds, right? You care about your, you detecting in under a second, right? And that's where strong scaling comes into play. Strong scaling allows you to take a single problem and break it up onto multiple devices to solve that problem faster. And that's effectively what uh, uh, Grok does. So we can actually strong scale extremely fast, extremely well. Um, and what makes us different is when we incepted the processor, uh, we actually started with the software and compilation problem first. We did not build the architecture from a bottoms up approach. So if you take a look at what the, a lot of the incumbents are doing is they have a market, you know, CPUs, graphics cards, they do really good with graphics, they do really good with, you know, control flow heavy designs. And then when they took a look at AI or machine learning, they incrementally tweaked the hardware to optimize for that space. We took a very different approach where we started with the application, went to the software, and then thought about what is the optimal hardware that you need to solve this problem? So it's kind of going top to back and working backwards. And if you take a look at our architecture, it intuitively looks very different. Like it, it looks very different than what you see on a graphics card. And it's tuned and specialized for things like large language models uh, and computer vision. And we do really well on that. So how are you specialized for large language models? Can you speak a little bit more generally about that? Yeah, I think the key thing about that, I guess, first of all, we've, we've essentially created a language processing unit here at Grok, uh, which I believe today is actually the fastest uh, processor to run these large language models. So we've run uh, some of the open source models that Meta has provided. So Meta, they have their Llama 2, you know, 70 billion uh, parameters. Uh, we're getting well over 250 tokens per second today. Uh, we, we hope to double that, you know, in the coming months. But it, it's something that uh, no one else can do. Again, I think this comes down to the fact that we support this notion of strong scaling that is quite infeasible with other devices. So we can actually take these massive models, chop them up across, you know, 10 chips, 100 chips, 1,000 chips, and run it as one holistic problem. We effectively are extending a single device across thousands of devices and sharing everything across them. Because we have a lot of high bandwidth memory, we have a lot of high bandwidth interconnect between the chips, we can strong scale across those devices and hit these numbers uh, that we see today and that we believe we can get in the future. And speaking of the future, what do you think we're going to see in technology the next five 10 years. What are you excited about? I mean, this is exciting, right? Like I'm, uh, you know, I've been working in the industry for, you know, 15-ish years and like I've, I've never seen this level of excitement um, in the space with, you know, high performance computing, machine learning, all these uh, chatbots that are coming out, large language models. They're really, this is just the beginning, right? Like yeah. we're, we're effectively proven the technology works, the next step is to understand the business models that work on top of this. Like the reality is, if you take a look at what's happening with this is, you know, every single inference on these uh, large language models, they're not profitable. People are not actually making money on these yet. But that's true with every new technology. So I think as the cost curve comes down on these things, for example, technologies like Grok, which are significantly more efficient and cheaper as they come out to the market and become more pervasive, that cost curve is going to come down and it'll become much more practical to deploy these in a production scenario and for businesses to actually uh, you know, 
reap the benefits of these things. Like, quite honestly, right now, there's only one player that's making money in this space, and it's the hardware vendor. Um, and it's mainly because there's a, there's a structural problem in the industry, right? I think over time, that structural problem where all the profits are going to one vendor today, it's going to be alleviated. That always happens, right? This is not sustainable for just one player to be sucking up all the profits and then, you know, it's kind of being funded by Microsoft and Google who have enough money to kind of lose money in this space for now, but not forever. Yeah. And I think that is going to be the biggest change. Once you sort of see uh, more vendors come into the this, this space, once you see more startups grow and, and show the success that they can get, uh, It'll create more competition. It'll create much more interesting use cases and cost-effective use cases and the pervasiveness of ML into society uh, for the benefit of everybody. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and I really hope you enjoy your time at the show. Thank you. Thank you.